Okay, so as we talk about blood and chakra, we talk about labs, um, IV fluids, other fluids, blood orders, uh, shock, and then sepsis. I don't think we're going to get to sepsis today, uh, maybe in the afternoon. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to go back and cover other content. Um, and it's important to cover the other content because uh, NCLEX, and we're trying to get uh, prepared for um, IV fluids and NCLEX. And um, there's certain things that you need to know. And that's kind of what we're going to cover here. Right. NCLEX and fluids. All right. So when we're talking about fluids and NCLEX, um, you, you're responsible to know this, IV fluids. Right. And we're going to talk about all the different types of IV fluids and why it's important to know. Um, because it goes back to the med question. If there's a med in the question, it's a question about that med. And usually it's assessment before implementation unless the patient is acute or in distress. Right? So if you saw a med and it was a liver medication, right? it's did you assess those liver enzymes prior to giving, and that's the AHAP-C um, method. And when you're looking at it, IV fluids, it's the same thing. So it's very important to think about that when, the, when you're giving IV fluids and it's in the question, it's always about these certain things. But we're going to talk a little bit more about um, in practice and when it's important and what we need to know. All right, so... Uh, Labs, right? So labs are always acute, especially with uh, IV fluids. And when we're looking at IV fluids, we always said that we're talking about the uh, boat. And IV fluids are correcting the boat, the problem, right? The problem that's underlying. So when you're looking at um, fluid status, we have different conditions, right? So we had, um, we had, low fluid volume, right? We had hypervolemic, like a CHF patient. And then we have um, uh, uvovolemic, right? So uvovolemic is a, a normal patient, right? So they're normal hemotensive. So their BP, um, their blood pressure would be normal, right? And we know that blood pressure should be normal, systolic greater than 100, um, and mean arterial pressure, greater than 70, 75. And that's important because that is the uh, brain, right? And um, because that's perfusion and that's level of consciousness. Right? We talked about that in distress. And level of consciousness is stress, disorientation is based on perfusion. But we also said that we go on further to the kidneys. In the kidneys, our uh, mean arterial pressure is 60 to 65. Because if that mean arterial pressure is less than 60, as in a hypovolemic patient, that patient will um, have no urine output. So that's important to know. So we talk about fluid loss, right? So when you're giving fluid, I mean, rocket science, right? So you're giving fluid, but it's usually because of fluid, because of fluid loss. Right? And that's the main principle behind fluid, IV fluid administration. However, NCLEX will test you on whether or not you know the different types of fluids. And if a patient, they'll present a patient, whether they're CHF, uvovolemic, or hypovolemic. But also we're going to talk a little bit about this today, sodium, and how sodium is an important aspect with IV fluids. And we start to look at that. All right, so fluid loss. All right, so let's talk about some basic things about fluid loss. So a person just sitting in bed, right, daily is going to have anywhere between 500 to 1,000 cc's uh, loss, right? So that's just sitting around. And that's why it's so important because in the hospital, when you have a hospital, you have the patients um, sitting in the bed, right? So we get them up and moving. However, just sitting in bed all day long is going to be 500 to 1,000. Now, if you add temperature to that, right, you're going to increase this this loss, this fluid loss. Hence, then we start to see patients that, you know, become dehydrated just by sitting there, right? So that's important to know. Then we have our basic urine output. So you add these two together, right? So 500 to 100, it gives you 1500, right? And then that goes to 25 second stage, right? 25 cc's out in a day. So every day that you're gonna lose in your urine, 
um, 15 to 2,500. All right, so that's a lot of fluid loss if you're starting to think about this, right? And if, and if the patient has a high temperature um, and they are sweating on top of it, you know, I mean, you're going to need IV fluids. So we know that we're going to monitor the BUN and creatinine um, to make sure that the kidneys are, in fact, working. And we know that that is 30 cc's an hour or 424 hours, right? That's the bare minimum. And we've seen that with the renal, and we talked about that before. Um, so NCLEX wants you to know that, you know, just basically just over the first hour, it's generally two hours or more, right? It, but you actually want to see 400, greater than 400 in 24 hours, right? So then we said that previously, we we're, we're going to talk about how, you know, with a bladder scan, we assess that bladder. So one, 100 to 300 for urine. And that's what the normal bladder should be saying. So because if the bladder scan is means that the person is um, perfusing, they should have uh, you know, unless they're taking like anticholinergics or something like that, then you have retention. Right? Anticholinergics, right? Dries them up. Right? Also, we talked about that with morphine, right? Because morphine also has anticholinergic like properties. Right, so fluids. Um, so we have the mean arterial pressure, so we can monitor it. Uh, we have our, you know, normal hemodynamics as far as understanding about fluid status. And this is all important because as we move into shock, shock is all about fluids. And we talked about previously that this is alpha out here, and um, we said that A upside down is V, and that's vasoconstrict. So alpha is very important for vasoconstriction. Now, with sepsis patients, they have problems with alpha. They don't vasoconstrict, hence they dilate. So a person who's uvovolemic becomes hypovolemic very quickly. So that's why treatment is usually vasopressors. And then we talked about beta receptors, right? So beta lungs and then beta. So beta is where the pulse comes in when the person is hypovolemic. So because the fact is that the brain up here, right, the brain says that, hey, wait a second here, I have decreased cardiac output, so therefore increase that heart rate. Now, the mean arterial pressure is the result of, it's just telling you, we measure that to see that the person is hypovolemic. So as we move into sepsis, we're going to start to talk about these fluids and which fluids to give and which not to give and, and why do we do it. So we need to go to the next step, which is what kinds of fluids do we have? So what we have is, is that when we're looking at um, fluids, we have three different types, okay? Well, there's actually, there's two types that we have. It's called crystalloids, crystalloid and um, colloid, colloid. Okay, so those are two types. So as you're doing questions, you know, they may not talk about normal saline. They might say it's a crystalloid, right? So that would mean that you need to know there's a difference between these two, okay? So crystals, right, crystals are basically what they are, right? Electrolytes, those type of things, crystals. And it's a crystalloid solution. Those are separated into three different types, right? So isotonic, hypotonic, and hypertonic, right? And you can see that here, isotonic, hypotonic, hypertonic. Right? We'll talk about all the three different types and why you'd give one over the other and why they're most important, right? But the most important thing about this is when you're looking at IV fluids, is that if you're doing questions, they're gonna talk about, like I said, a crystalloid. You're gonna give a colloid. Um, what you have to say, okay, well, if it's crystalloid, that's like if I said to you, the patient has CHF, okay? If the patient has CHF, you say to yourself, is that right or is that left side, okay? So crystalloid is a general term for three different types, okay? So it's a higher arching concept. All right. So the difference on this, on a colloid, so colloid collects, colloid collects in the vascular space. 
So if a person is hypovolemic like this, a colloid is like albumin, okay? It's like a sponge and it collects and allows for vascular uh, volume without increasing volume shifts, right? So we'll talk a little bit more about that because albumin does cause some shifting, but when you're giving a colloid, we saw that before with um, head of starch. Head of starch is a colloid. Starch is a, um, is a starch, right? So if you put water on starch, it becomes all clumpy, right? So that's kind of what it does inside the vascular space. So crystalloids allow for fluid exchange where colloids collect inside the vascular area. All right, so let's go further and we're gonna start moving into uh, a little bit more closely. Are there any questions right now? All right, so this is repeat, all right? So you put, you've got this all in nursing one and nursing two, right? So, you know, so this is just a re reiteration of all this content. But what we're doing in nursing five is we're gonna re-pull it back and then we're going to relook really at it, right, in a way that makes it applicable to what we're doing. Because a lot of times it's like, oh yeah, no, we'll say we're going to you know. So you get tested on this comprehension, but not the application of it. Right? So that's kind of what we're doing right now. So, so the first rule is, if you have a question, it's crystalloid or colloid. It's a generic question about whether you understand there's a concept behind them. So now we're going to move down into the types. I never drop fluids, but maybe just me. Yeah, I think, yeah. I mean, that's kind of why I do it in nursing five is, is that I think that it's one of those things that they have a sense that they talked about it or it just kind of it's glazed over and then you're doing it in clinical and then that's it. And I was like, oh yeah, what is it? Colloid or crystalloid, you know, you're like, whatever, you know, and then you do your note card and then you submit it. And then, so, um, Applications, everything. So, and that's kind of why we're talking about that. And as you're doing questions, you probably see questions like that: crystalloids versus colloids, and different things. All right. So, so let's go further. All right. So now we're going to do um, break it down. All right. So, so what do I mean by that? Well, I mean exactly what I said. Uh, all right. So, ACOR. Right. So, ACOR is um, an assessment process that I use. Right. So, uh, nursing team. So I'll copyright that, right? So 2000, whatever. All right, all right, so this is how I think about uh, meds, right? So when I walk into the room and I see a IV fluid, right? So if I go into the room and I see an IV fluid, uh, the first thing I think about is where is it, right? So I say, okay, well, how many IV lines do they have? All right, so is it, is it on the wrist, right? So if it's on the wrist, right, that makes it acute. Okay, and what do I mean by acute? It, it means that if it's on the wrist down here, um, it's a it's a it's a more of acute area to put in because it requires a smaller gauge um, IV. So that's generally like a 22. Right? So 22s are acute, and we're talking about IV um, gauges here, so catheters, right, that go into the vein. And if I see a 22 blue, that's a Q. Because I think to myself, okay, well, well, why didn't they go up, right? Because the closer to the core you are, the more chronic you are, well, for IVs, right? So generally what happens is if I see it down here, somebody has a blue over here, okay? Because you only do blues in the hand, blues and yellows, right? So yellow is really a Q really tiny spider veins or peats. We tend to use those and we'll tend to do them up here and it's phallic and stuff like that. So blue, right, acute. Right? I expect to see pink. Okay? So pink is uh, chronic, it's chronic and it's good, okay? And AC, so I say generally as a new grad, always AC first. Oh, it's uncomfortable, doesn't matter. Your goal right away, as a, especially as a new grad, as a new nurse, is, is do what you're most likely to do, be successful for. And pinks are what you go for first. So you always go pink first. And you'll never put a pink in the hand. Right? Because when you're looking at this catheter, 
this pink is bigger, okay? And it's longer, right? So then if you looked at a yellow, the yellow would be back here, okay? So that's a, this is a 24, this is a 22, and this is a 20 gauge. Okay, and that's how they start to work. Then you go, you know, green, right? So then you have, you know, green 18 gauge, right? And green are coming into um, the cube, and we see those, you know, right here, ACs, 18 gauge, right? And that's in trauma. Trauma, that's what you want in there because of the, the, they can provide the most opening and vascularization, right? So the rules are you go into the room and you see an IV, right? I look at the color to see what do I have, right? So if I have a blue in the hand or over here, I'm a little bit like, okay, well, if I lose that, I'm, gonna have, I'm not gonna go in with a 20, right? So it generally is, it's a second choice that you go in with a blue. So you always go with the pink first, then you go blue. All right, so why is this important? Because we're gonna talk about blood today. Right? We're gonna to talk about gauges, and that's the only time you start to see this, right? These gauges showing up with blood transfusions. All right, so assessment, that's part of my assessment. So if I walk into the room, I look at, um, oh crap. All right, so part of my assessment is I look at the IV color. And once I know that IV color, then I can assess what kind of patient I have, right? Or what, you know, now that's, this is the 80-20 rule because, you know, I mean, majority of the population will act, you know, work this way. You know, you might have that 20% that goes in there with a pink and or a blue and puts it up here, you know what I mean? But that's not most likely. All right, so assessment. So the next thing I think about is if I see an IV up. Okay, so the first thing I do is on the IV pole is I count bags. Now these are just leftover bags or what have you, and a lot of times we'll do that to, you know, if we're moving through our patients, right? And so if I see three bags up there, right, and I'm doing my sham all day and I'm doing my assessment, I do this, one, two, three. So that means there's three bags up there, right? So this patient's more acute than going up there just seeing one bag. What I mean by that, those could be running or not running. So the first thing is if they're just hanging there, okay, I either have, what if they were all Zosin? Well, I have three bags of Zosin up there. That makes no sense. That's a sloppy nurse, right? So they were not cleaning up their basics. They're not doing their basic uh, practice. So, so when they give a report or what they said in a report, is it actually so? Right? If they're not doing these basic things of, you know, just basically taking care of this stuff and leaving what they should have, um, that patient's more acute to me. Second thing is if it's running. So if I see a... a IV running, I'll put a little dot there, okay? And that will tell me later on that I need to look over here in these IVs, what it is. And that makes that patient more acute than a patient that just has nothing running, okay? So that's my assessment. And I say to myself, okay, well, is the bag big or little? So that's hanging up there. Is it an IV fluid and or is it a little bag, okay? So, a big IV bag tends to be chronic, and a little IV bag tends to be acute. And the reason this is acute is because this is usually ordered because of, you don't walk home with a small IV bag, right? You know, walk home with a large IV bag, but a larger IV bag is a chronic thing working on fluid, where a small IV bag is doing something right now, okay? It also will make me think about like what I need to do with this patient over time. So um, like how busy I'm going to be, for example. Okay, so I count my bags and I say, does it affect this patient's assessment? Okay, so that's what I want to think about. And we'll talk about those when we go through IV fluids. You know, how does it affect my assessment? So generally is, is it, a, is it a blood pressure thing? Or is it a lung thing? Or is it a fluid thing? 
you know, and that's what I have to figure out. The next thing is C, is it compatible? And the reason that's important is because of, and you'll see this, right? So lactated ringers, for example, you know, LR, you know, never let running or leave running, sorry, leave running LR, right? Because it's acute. You don't always give it, you know, you only give it in specific things and you never leave it running. So I would see, if I see lactated rings up there, I would have this question. Well, chances are, if they're giving antibiotics, they have small bags up there, and it's going through LR, that antibiotic is not working. Because inside that lactated ring is, is lactate and all those type of things. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. So lactated ring is are always acute. So whenever you walk into the room and you see lactated ring is, you stop and you go through your assessment. Why is it still up? You know, why does this patient need this? Right? Normal saline, I would expect if I saw an IV floater. But if I see lactated ring is, I stop. I say, when can this come down? How long has it been running? And why is this so long? All right, so compatible comes back to, you know, when we talk about these others down here, normal saline, D5 normal, and stuff like that. So I generally will say, is it, is it compatible with what's being given, right? Like, is it, with, is it compatible with the antibiotics and different things? I don't memorize all that stuff because, I mean, so over time, you, you know, you know, like Flago, you know, or Metrodonazole, right? Flag of you know farting flag, all right. So you know, I mean, you know, uh, you know, flag has no friends, right? So it doesn't. It's not compatible with a lot of things, right? It's mainly for GI. It likes a dark bag. All these type of things it likes dark places. That's why I call it farting flag. All right. So ordered. Why is it ordered, right? So why why do they have lactated ringers? Why do they have normal saline? Why do they have D five normal? Right. So I sit there. I just don't accept, okay, you know, here it is. I put it up, put the bag in, take it down, put it up. You know, I don't do that. I stop. I, I go through this assessment every single time when I first go into a room. Because whatever the, the nurse was doing before, you know, I'm not in charge of their practice. So I don't know if they're doing this. I don't know if they're just slinging bags. You know, they go in, they take it down, they go in, they take it down. So what I always want to say is, okay, I have my own process. So that's why, you know, Shamal D, what we do is all about this. So if you walk into the room, despite what you've heard, it doesn't make it so. So assessment first, is it compatible? Why is it ordered? And the last thing is R, running. Does it still need to be running? Now, if the patient's eating a hamburger and has a shake there and, you know, whatever, why is it still running? It doesn't make any sense. So therefore, those are questions. So I always have these questions, and you always want to be that change agent. You always want to be that nurse looking at IV fluids and not just being doing the mechanics of IV fluids, right? It's always application assessment off. All right, so let's start to break it down a little bit more. So that's the main thing, right? So this ACOR assessment, this is kind of what I do when I look at Medicaid uh, labs. So the next thing I'm going to talk about is uh, the three different types. Right, so we have isotonic, we have hypotonic, and then we have hypertonic. Right, as far as the NCLEX is concerned, they want you to know these are all crystalloids, right? So they're all crystalloids, and they're they're, they're different in their mechanism of how they do it. So if they say crystalloids, they're saying one of these three things, all right? The next thing you need to know is, is that what is each one? What do they do? How do they work, right? So, so the th first thing we're going to look at, my beard's getting itchy, is, is hyper, isotonic, isotonic, right? So isoperfect, right? So it's called the land, high five for dry, it's dry. Okay, so those are your isotonics, right? So, <clears throat> lactated ringers, 
any patient, right? Any normal patient will receive these generally, okay? Um, normal saline and D5, okay? Well, D5 is interesting because it's isotonic in the bag. And this is a trick question, right? So D5 in the bag is isotonic. Okay, so, wait, I'm gonna mess that up. Hold on. No, it's hypertonic in the bag, becomes isotonic in the body, sorry. Flip that, and that would make sense because hypertonic, right? Hyper, a lot of sugar, tonic, right? So, um, normal saline is the N, right? So normal saline, I mean, we know that, right? Okay, so, in my notes here, I've been writing with some notes. All right, so let's take each one. So isotonic, isoperfect, right? So any normal patient, right? So LAN D5, okay? So those are all isotonic solutions. What that means is, is that any patient that needs normal vascular, or, you know, they can handle normal, yeah, any person, right? So, so you have L-A-N-D-5, high five, high is dry, right? All right, so lactated ring is, let's take each one first, right? We'll take normal saline because that's the one we see most likely. So if I was to categorize these as far as acute to chronic, which is most acute, which is most chronic, okay? So chronic would be normal saline. Right, that's what I expect. I walk into the room, I see normal saline. That's any patient, right? So, any person, any patient, you know, most likely, right? So, something that's easily corrected. So, isotonic means that if you have fluid shifts and you have the cells here, right, and you have two cells, they're basically moving back and forth. So, you have the ECF and the ICF, right? And it's basically going back and forth. It's isotonic, it's isoperfect, it's perfect movement back and forth of fluids. So you're kind of like a washing the person out, right? So you're kind of moving fluids back and forth and all those type of things. So there's nothing wrong with it. Um, so we generally will keep that up and that's a normal patient because it's most likely the same as the patient, right? So most likely, it's most likely about how the patient's normal vascular osmolarity is in the person. So, so that's normal saline, um, most likely. Then you have your second one, which would be lactated ringus, okay? So lactated ringus is acute, right? It's more acute than normal saline because you don't expect it. And when you're looking at it, you know, I mean, you look for the bump, right? So it's given for the bump, lactated ringus, right? So lactated ringus never leave running, I call it. Right, LR, it's also called, and it's given for a bump. Burns, maternity, post-op patients, and urgent trauma patients. Okay, that's when we give it, right? And it's, it's an important thing because of these are all acute things. We don't normally have these type of patients and it's because of the lactate, right? So generally the body in a stressful environment, any kind of major muscle injury, those type of things, you have an increase of acidosis going on. So you need a buffer to kind of make sure that that person is kind of becoming hemodynamically stable without becoming more acidotic. Now normal saline, is going to be not really great for those patients because they have an actual injury happening to the body. You think about this, burns, maternity stress on the tissues, post-op patients, injury, 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 right? So, you know, those type of patients, um, they need kind of a buffer and they also need repairing electrolytes and different things like that. So that's the big thing about lactated ringers. Yes, it's isotonic, it's isoperfect, but only perfect for specific 
patients. And you shouldn't leave it running. It shouldn't stay with, patient doesn't stay post-op forever. Person doesn't stay maternity forever, right? Or postpartum, you know? So you're gonna need a patient to be, it's up, then it's corrected, and then they move on. Because why do we worry about it? Well, the main reason you, don't, you worry about it is you worry about liver patients and renal patients. So LR, liver and renal. They tend to be uh, contraindicated for these patients. So you check the you know, liver enzymes, those type of things. And you also check you know, B1 creatinine. Now it doesn't mean absolutely all patients, this side and the other thing. If their liver don't give it to them in this side. You know, it's a case by case basis. It's good to know, right? Not need, not need to know. So it's, it's just a general assessment that you look at and it has to do with the bioavailability of lactate and liver converts that lactate. Right? So we'll talk a little bit, probably not, right? But uh, main thing you need to know, LR, liver and renal patients are generally contraindicated with lactate arrhythmias. All right, so also is this patient a burn patient, a trauma patient, a maternity patient or post-op patient? So the next thing you have to know is why do we give it, right? So we give it for those patients, but because of the collapse, right? So C-L-A-P-S, right? So uh, chloride is in it, lactate is in it, requires assessment of bump. Are they one of these patients? Are they still acute? So you're always assessing this, potassium and sodium. See, that's the crazy thing about it. It has all the stuff in it. And a lot of times people don't think about that. Oh, lactate ring is all oh, the post op, but lactate ring is up, blah, blah, blah. But you don't think about the basics. You don't see the trees, let me see the trees in the forest. And the trees in the forest is, well, is it a liver patient? Is it a renal patient, right? Is it bump? And that makes sense now. You start to think about isotonic patients is should it still be up, right? And so that's why we start to change it. So I, I in clinical, we always talk about that is, is that we always say that in clinical, it's like if you see LR, how long is it up? And you start to do this assessment. And a lot of times we, we address that right away because a lot of times the nurses are just slinging bags. And that's kind of what it is. So having a process, having an assessment. So let's talk a little bit about these things. Okay, so it's very specific about the certain percentages of all these things. Now you're not, NCLEX will never test you on that, right? So this is nuts to know, but it's cool to know, right? So it is kind of cool to understand as far as like, understand the basic uh, principle behind it. So how do you figure this stuff out of like how much is in a bag without memorizing it, right? And that's always the goal is like, how do I memorize what's in lactated ringers, right? So if you've already memorized it, that's the cool thing about this. So let's look at it. So if we're looking at um, lactated ringers and we're looking at the claps, okay. So if we look at chloride, Okay, so let's take chloride first. Well, we already know chloride here, right? So we already know that, you know, chloride is generally 95 to 105, right? So there's basically about 105 chloride in that, right? Give or take one or two, I mean, but it gives you the general idea of how much chloride is actually in there, right? So now we're gonna move down to uh, lactate. Right? So lactate, I always think of lactate as a buffer. Right, so when I think about a buffer, I think about bicarb, right, HCO3 or CO2 buffer. And then I say, okay, well, that is normal 2, 2, 2, 6. And I also said 2, 8, right? So um, there's about 26, 28 lactate in there, right? And then we go down to potassium. Well, we also know potassium, right, is 3 to basically about 5. This is isotonic, it's isoperfect. So there's about four milliequivalents of potassium in it, right? That's how much is in it, right? So then we have sodium, which is the last one. And sodium is 135 to 145, okay? And it's about 
135 sodium milli equivalents. And that's it. I mean, you've already learned this. So that's, you just have to add on this. And that's how you know how much you're actually giving. That's important to know. So you can kind of see how this can be isotonic, right? Because you're dealing with all this stuff that is fluid electrolytes. So we learned that this is all related to what? The three Ps, which is peeing, pooping, right? Puking, right? All fluid related. And it's the same thing as far as drains, the quadruple Ds, right? So, you know, drains, diuretics, um, diarrhea, and blah, 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 blah. I forget the last thing. Hey, who's teaching this, right? So, and that makes sense, right? So lactated ring is, is a very specific med, right? Because it's giving all this type of things. And that makes sense now why a renal patient, right, doesn't get it. It doesn't mean that they won't get it. It just means that tread lightly on renal patients with this. Why are you giving them potassium? Think about that. You can have four milli equivalents. Now, if they have a GFR and you're looking at that GFR and that GFR is less than 15, I would tread very lightly about this lactated oringus for this patient, right? All right, so no, another cool thing is lactic acid, right? Lactate. Well, lactate is generally converted by the liver. So if a person has elevated liver enzymes, um, they'll have difficulty uh, metabolizing and changing lactate to a buffer. And um, that's why lactate is. So, so that's why the LR. All right, so uh, like I said before, um, you learn that nursing too, right? So let's get into it and some more questions. All right, so what else do we have? Uh, that helpful? I mean, like I said, a lot of this stuff is kind of a little bit nuts to know, but it's easy to know once you understand how it goes and how you start to have a process behind it. It's not just, NCLEX never wants you just memorizing content, right? They just want you to have a process about it, how you look at it. All right, so we handled uh, lactated ringers, and we handled, um, we handled uh, normal saline, so we said that this was one, this is two, and then three. D, five, high five, high is dry. Okay, so mainly patients who are, you know, hyper natremic, high sodium. And we know that high sodium is dry. And even though it is mainly hypertonic, We'll talk about this when we get to hypertonics. Anything with D5 is hypertonic generally, except for D5, right? D5 and water, right? So it's hypertonic in the bag. The minute you put it in the body, it becomes hyper, no, hypotonic, which is the next one we're going to talk about. So when we're talking about hypotonic patients, you're talking about um, fluid shifts. And the big problem with hypotonic is which ones are they, right? So the principle is this, right? So if you have fluids and you have fluid and the patient is, um, is dry, right? So you have your cells right here. And you have all this water out here, okay? What hypotonic, so think of a hippo, right? So hippotonic, don't judge my hippo. I don't know if you can get a tail or not. So hippotonics makes the cells swell, okay? Builds them up, all right? So that's the basic principle. So if you have somebody who is uvovolemic, and then you give them hypotonic medications, well, fluids, sorry, they become dry, okay? 
And that's a problem because all the fluid that was in the vascular space has now moved out, right, of the vascular space into the cells. So the cells all start to swell up. They become like big hippos. So the way I remember this is 45 ton hippo. Okay. So a 45 ton hippo, so that would be NACL, 0.45 NACL, or 45 uh, normal saline. So 45 ton hippo, okay? That is a hippotonic solution, which means that all the fluid that's in the ECF will go into the cells and the cells will start to swell, which will cause the patient to become dry. And that's a big problem. So why do we give it? Well, we generally don't give it for head injury, right? That would make sense, right? Because if you suddenly are giving all this fluid and it goes into the cells, pop, right? And next thing you know, that's a, we don't want that to happen. So what's the problem with it? Well, if the problem is the patient has a high sodium, and high chloride, right? We worry about that, okay, because of these fluid shifts. And what do you need to know is just the principle that when you have a hypotonic fluid, this concept will happen. So NCLEX will test on whether or not you know this. So what do you assess? Well, I would assess lung sounds, that's always priority before any, any. IV fluid, okay, so, because patients develop crackles, well, is it because of the fluid, or why? Did they have crackles before? So always, always, always assess before you give an IV fluid. The last one we're gonna talk about, um, so we don't see, hype, you know, um, hypotonics a lot, you know? And a lot of times you do it for, because it's got sugar in it, right? So, and when they don't, no, sorry, not that it has sugar in it. It's when they don't need sugar, right? So, but they still need fluid shifts and they still need um, volume expanders. But you don't see it an awful lot. You usually see these down here, hypertonics and such like that. So let's talk about that next. So hyper, Tonic. So a hypotonic is um, the direct opposite of a hypotonic. So when you have a hypertonic, you have, you know, basically what happens is the fluid, right, leaves the cells, right? So you get fluid that comes outside the cells. So the problem with that is all this fluid is now in this vascular space, okay? So you have where a person might have been normal tensive, right? And now all of a sudden all this fluid comes in. So lung sounds become very important for these type of patients because they're at risk for, holy crap, fluid overload. All the fluid suddenly comes out of the cells into the vasculature. Next thing you know, you have crackles. So that's very acute. So we always watch for a patient with hypertonic solutions. So how do I remember hypertonic? Is generally sugar water, right? So, so D5 um, with normal saline, lactated ringers, 0 0.45. Now this is important to see here. See, this is different. See this dextrose? See dextrose, dextrose, dextrose. So all these have sugar. So make sure that that Osmolarity is very high. So think about what that is. Osmolarity, right, concentration. So high concentration. Well, you think about that. You take some sugar packets, you put it in there. That's going to be very concentrated with sugar. So it makes sense. It's a hypertonic solution. So what does it do? Sugar loves water, right? So what happens is you think about eating some candy. Eating candy, eating candy, eating candy, eating candy. Next thing you know, you get that film and everything, you become very thirsty. Right? Same kind of concept is, is that all the sugar 
needs this water, right, to kind of dilute it, kind of get things going. So where does it get the water? From the cells. So it pulls all of it out and comes into it. So it's a very interesting, delicate balance when we're talking about hypertonic solutions. So what do we worry about? Well, some things that some specifics about hypertonics is, um, you know, club, right? So CHF patients were concerned about the lungs, right? And we assess their lungs before we give this because they're at risk for fluid overload, right? And also, um, brain. It's good for brain. So think of when we get back to like mannitol, right? So when we're looking at like mannitol, um, it's all sugar water. Well, sometimes you give D5 normal, right? So for normal brain injury, you give them some D5 sugar water. Um, that's usually when they're not using mannitol, right? So that's where you see D5 normal for head injury. That's different D5W, right? Because D5W, we said, was um, hypotonic, isotonic to hypotonic. What is the U? Uh, urgent, right? Urgent brain. I just put it there just to memorize club. Yeah. All right, so... Um, so lung assessment's important. You usually see it with brain injury. And um, think of it just as sugar water, sugar, hyper, hypertonic. All right, so there's, there's three ways that they would approach this content, right? So one would be uh, you have a crystalloid. Your first thing is with the crystalloid, is it isotonic, hypertonic, or hypotonic? Second thing, so you have crystallite first, then you have generics, right? So isotonic, hyper, and then hypo. And then you have, okay, well, they come in here. You have an isotonic solution, hypertonic solution, hypotonic. All they're asking then is how the fluid goes, right? Then they'll ask, you have normal saline, you have lactated ringers or you have um, D5 and a half and so on and so forth, okay? So that's a good thing about um, IV fluids. Now, the big thing about it is what do you do? Well, either you're gonna be asked about, you know, uh, most likely it's about fluid shifts, lung sounds, as far as the most likely. It's always assessed lung sounds prior to giving it. However, um, there are some different things. You only, only, give normal saline with blood, never lactated ringers. Because lactated ringers doesn't go with anything. All right, um, what else we got? Normal saline, diabetics, okay, yeah, we're talking about. All right, so, any questions so far? All right, so now as we look at the sheet, we can look at, you know, normal saline, right? So we say normal patients, just like that patient, uh, keeps even fluid shifts, first line defense, so on and so forth. Lactated ringers, then we have the bump, we get burns, urgent, trauma patients, maternity, uh, post-op patients. We're going to monitor, you know, we worry because collapse, right? So chloride you know, um, lactate, lactate, lactate um, potassium, sodium. And those are the only reasons that you'd be giving this, right? So then you talk about, you know, the land, right? So lactate ring is, normal saline, and D5, right? D5 is good for hypernatremic patients, but don't not for brain injury patients, because dextrose with water is going to make that patient uh, become hypotonic, and that would cause problems with cerebral edema. Next thing we have is the 45-ton hippo, which is 0.45 saline or sodium chloride, and uh, just knowing that the fluid will go into the cells, 
And that's why it's such a big deal with intracranial pressure. Then you have um, dextrose water, which dextrose sugar, hyper sugar. Then you think about um, it is good for head injury and generally for diabetics, right? When we don't want them to, you know, um, let's, let's flap that, scratch that goes back to hypothalamic. Hypo, hypoglycemia, right? So hyper is good for increasing um, plasma. So think about that. It's, it's, it's going to make the cells shrink. So the fluid's going to go into the vascular space, which is a problem if they have CHF because they're going to become fluid overload. But always come down to the assessment. Assessment, is it compatible? Is it ordered? Why is it ordered? And why is it still running? All right, so now next we're going to talk about colloids, right? So colloids, we said that, are different because that's a general topic. And colloids collect in the vascular space. So think of a patient who is hypovolemic. And we don't want fluid shifts. Okay, so we don't want the fluid going in and out of the cells and all these type of things. So a lot of times what we do is we give them some volume support without causing this whole shifting going on. And those are colloids, so dextran, uh, head of starch, hespan. Okay. So the same issue is that you're still going to have risks of fluid overload and other problems with that. So always goes back to the basics, lungs, lung assessment prior to colloids. All right, so then we have cryoprecipitate. You'll never be tested on that. Um, we'll talk about bowel wilderness today, DIC, hemorrhage. Uh, fresh frozen plasma. We talked about with um, with myasthenia gravis, Guillain Barre. When we start to move out plasma phoresis, they get fresh frozen plasma. But you'll never be tested on this. Um, platelets only in response to low platelets. Um, this is generally all given in the ICU. And then mannitol, we already talked about as far as um, as far as uh, head injury. All right, so now as we move it towards blood. All right, so NCLEX and blood. All right, so what do we need to know? All right, well, the big thing with blood is that when we're looking at blood, we're looking at the CBC. So we need to know about the CBC and, and um, some basic principles about uh, that, right? What's the normal mechanisms, right? And we talked about hemoglobin and hematocrit, and the hemoglobin normally being, we said there's four, sorry, so this is four to 10, right? It looks like a 10, and this is four, four spaces. So four to 10, and then we said we add these two together, so then we have 14, and then we have 14, then we get the 18, and we say that that's males, and then, uh, then you subtract two, right? So two and then 16, it's females. All right, that's an important concept because if they refer to males or females, that's important, right? I don't think it's gonna happen because I think they normally would just give you hemoglobin um, and know that that's responsible for, for, for blood. We need to know it because of, we're doing the content uh, and NCLEX will test, will test on that specific. So if you have a hemoglobin, it says, is this a male or female? And if it's not there, generic statement. So we assess this and that's important because when we're looking at this assessment, we assess the H and H. Well, we said that we don't care about high. And the reason we don't care about high is that's polycythemia, those are autoimmune stuff, not tested on. Most likely to be tested on is low and blood administration. And blood administration is acute. You need to know it. You need to know the steps. You need to know when there's a problem. You will be tested on it. Most likely it's a high NCLEX testability because of your responsibilities to the community. And community is the most important because the community is your responsibility to show up at in an emergency and know how to look at blood and how to administer blood.
right? So first step is we need to look at the H and H, right? So if it's low, how low do we go? That's policy driven. That's changed over the years. That's all over the place. So as you're doing questions, especially outdated questions, you're going to see H and H ranges. So NCLEX won't give you H and H ranges unless it's coupled with trauma. And we usually say eight is intubate, right? So for a GCS of eight, you intubate. However, you know, less than eight, you might get blood. Okay, so same kind of concept. Doesn't mean it's absolutely positively true. It's always policy driven. All right, so the next thing we need to know is some basics behind it. So look at the H and H, and we say that we look at the H and H first, and then we go down to, is that normal or is it abnormal? If it's normal, so if, let's just take 12, it's a 12, and right? it's a normal patient, right? So we're like, okay, that's normal. We go down to the, the hematocrit. So the next thing is, is that if we're looking at that H and H, hemoglobin and hematocrit, and this hemoglobin is 12, I'd expect this hematocrit to be 36, okay? Because hematocrit, triple. I never remember this, right? So, you know, I can times everything by three. Some of you on the math, not so sure. But hematocrit, triple, right? So it uh, should be 36, okay? So that's the first rule. So I look at the H, hemoglobin, then I go down to the hematocrit, okay? And it should be triple. If it is, like, say, 42, right? High is dry. So then I'm going to go over here. Are they dry? Is the BUN elevated? And that's what I would start to do. So I start to look at that and I look at the sodium. Sodium is also dry, right? Low potassium, right? Diuretics, so on. These, right? So that will confirm what's going on with that patient. So hemoglobin, hematocrit, if it's high, high is dry. All right. Next thing. Hemoglobin, okay? If it's low and it's, it's 10, first off, I'd expect this to be 30 because that should be triple, okay? Well, if it is 30, okay, it's still low. I circle both of them and then I say, is this an acute problem or a chronic problem? Right? We talked about that before. Acute would be bleeding, trauma, et cetera. Chronic would be renal or anemia, right? and we don't say anemia is generic, and that means something different for everybody, right? Because that's when we get to microcytic, macrocytic, and those are my clinical, we did that. All right, so acute, chronic, acute, chronic. So we're gonna talk about acute. So if you see blood in questions, it's an acute question, period, okay? And it's whether or not you recognize this is a problem or not. And that's what we're gonna talk about. So when we're talking about blood, um, let's talk about um, what blood is. Let's talk about this thing right here for us. This craziness down here, okay? First of all, you don't need to know that. Don't need to know it, right? So it's pretty simple, though. It's O, A, B, A, B, right? O, A, B, A, B. Okay, so this is how we set this up, okay? So O can receive O, O can give to A, O can give to B, and um, O can give to AB, right? A can give to A, right? And A can give to AB. B can give to B, and B can give to AB, right? And AB can only give to AB. That's it in a nutshell. That's blood transfusions. And, but NCLEX will never test on this process, okay? Um, this is just me just kind of being fancy, all right? So what do you need to know? Well, universal donor, universal recipient. That's the first thing. Okay? So as we looked, right, so this O right here would be the universal donor, right? All right, so what about A? Um, positive versus negative, right? That's RH factors, right? And that's Rogan. 
And that's a maternity question for you, maternity lovers. And that's when you are tested with the, the patients, the mother, you know, having, you know, positive versus negative and stuff like that. Okay. That's how NCLEX will test you on ROGAM and administration of it and also understanding this concept. Right. So the principle is, is I don't test them. Okay. So I'll test on ROGAM, positive, negative, because that's maternity and that's curriculum creep. And I'll get a ticket for that. So what do I test on? Right. So is, um, Universal donor, right? So universal donor is um, um, you're in a trauma situation, walk into the room, and you need to give blood, you know, what's the universal donor? Oh, no? Oh, yes, right? Oh, oh negative. Oh, no, right? Is the universal donor, okay? So, O negative is what we give in an acute situation. O no, O yes. So, that's how you remember that. That's how I remember it. So, O no, O yes. O negative, universal donor. Okay? So, universal recipient, any blood. Okay? And they, they become the universal recipient. All right. Um, that's a good place to stop. I think that uh, we'll come back and take a break and then... Uh, We'll continue on with blood and blood administration, transfusion, and um, go from there. So we'll come back at uh, 1 o'clock, and um, we'll start with that. Is there any questions about this so far? Right? Right, so nothing really on colloids. Um, you know, because you're given colloids like albumin, right? You're given head of starch. And it's always the same stuff, right? It's always lung cells, right? So, I mean, that's kind of the big um, the big thing with it. You know, they'll talk about them, the crystalloid. They'll talk about a colloid. You just need to know the language and what they're really talking about. You know, if you have, you know, like I said, if they say an isotonic solution, you have to go land, right? So you have to say lactated ringers, normal saline, D5, right? And, and just understand the concept. So if they say they're given a, a hypertonic solution, you just need to know that, well, okay, well, the fluid is going to leave the cells and go right into the vasculature. So the fluid overload, okay? And then if you have, you know, hypotonic and so on. So you, it's all about just fluid shifts in the right capacity of med surge and what's going to kill the patient. And the same thing when we talk about like any blood versus uh, O negative versus um, AB and so recipient versus donor. Those tend to be very easy questions because, I mean, did you get the content? Do you know the content? Do you know what's most important? They won't, they'll never give you, oh, you have an A plus patient and, you know, they're going to get A negative blood. Can they, you know, they'll never do that. However, you might have a trauma patient and you, you can't type and cross that patient. So what are you going to do? And then you could give them um, O negative, right? And so on. Or they do the reverse question. Patient is A, B. Will they talk about positive or negative? Only on O negative, right? And and generally, it's only a relationship to Rogam and uh, maternity questions about the fetus and then the mother and uh, what's going on over there. All right, guys, let's. I'll see you at one o'clock. <laughs>